Uh, good morning to Jim Talk. Uh, I actually, too, had to learn an instrument. And my mom tried to force me to play a flute. And I said, no way am I going to touch that thing. And then we, so we had a bit of a fight. And that, uh, so we had a bit of a fight. And we compromised because I wanted to be a rock star. So then I took guitar lessons. But then my teacher was actually a folk guitarist. And I wanted to be a rock star. So that didn't work out. And then, I, then she forced me to take piano lessons. So I sacrificed my Saturday morning, basically having to go to take piano lessons, which eventually I failed. By the time I actually started to do drumming, Afro-Caribbean drumming, at that point I just wanted to go dancing at the techno clubs. Um, anyway, so Blender Finesse. So thank you, Jim, for talking about the concept of this, of this strategy. So my goal is to present the, the project. So I'm Charles Paulette. I cover the Ghana and the financial institutions portfolio uh, for the USAID funded project, the West Africa Trade and Investment Hub. The project covers 18 countries and we have covered about no, over 90 partnerships between 2021 and May of 2022. And that 91 partnerships actually involve over $75 million in, in grant agreements covering various sectors and uh, value chains, over 30 value chains, but predominantly it's agriculture. We have 19 indicators that we have to track, but eventually there are four cardinal elements that we cover, and that is we need to mobilize over $400 million in partnerships. We need to, and those funding will need to be invested in SMEs, so that they can generate over $300 million in exports and over $375 million in sales, and as well as generate jobs. So how did we do this? So basically, we have three pathways to get to our target. We can work directly with the SME, we can work directly with their investor, or we can work directly with their advisor, who will work with the investor to release the funds to the SME. To the right, you will see a sample of our partners. And let me just talk about one or two of these, or three. You'll see Pacha Soap. Now, that's a US firm. But instead of working directly with the US firm, we actually work with their suppliers in Liberia and Ghana as part of our localization strategy. You'll see Wark. Wark is a farm services a startup. So they started in Sierra Leone. They wanted to expand in Ghana. And we basically took their concept and help them to expand, and now they're expanding across the country, uh, going over seven million dollars in, in over six million dollars in sales. And lastly, you'll see African Guarantee Fund. They are a guarantee fund. So this was under COVID, so we needed to unlock a lot of capital for the SMEs suffering from lack of access to lack of access to credit uh, during the crisis. So with that, our two million dollar first loss unlocked 20 million from a key investor. That 20 million dollars was then used to uh, convince over 20 banks in 15 countries to lend over 200 million dollars in over 3,000 SMEs. So as noted, we are geared towards empowering local firms. Most of our partners, nearly 90%, I would even say over 90, uh, 95, nearly all of them, actually have a very, very local component. That's either through the supply chain, through local players, or local investments. Now, of course, many of these companies, because we're keen to promote trade links between the US and, and West African firms, some of these startups are actually registering in the US because that's where the investors are. Uh, for instance, we have here FreezeLink, that is a cold chain startup. And we guided them and we advised and we worked with them about starting up their registration in Delaware because Delaware is the capital for venture capitalism. So as you can imagine, we have over 90 partners. We work with eight missions across 18 countries. And that sense of scope, which Jim referred to as scalability or replicability, it provides us a, with a lot of lessons learned uh, we're talking about what are the sil silver linings between different crops. We're talking about new crops. So we're launching the Fonio, a pearl millet, 
uh, native to West Africa as a new global value chain. Uh, Jim talked about value addition in the cashew. Again, that is a key West African crop. Uh, we've learned about how do we access data because that data is the marketing tool that we need to show to the market um, the, the success or the strengths of these, of these partnerships. So we actually have a very <laughs> extensive uh, process. As you can imagine, we have five years to basically prove this model in an environment beset with COVID, logistic issues, coup d'etats, political elections, uh, just a lot of high risk all around. And we didn't, re you know, we had a feeling that many of these deals would, could actually suffer. But to this date, actually no company has declared bankruptcy. So we screened over 800 transactions and we distilled it to over 90 transactions for partnerships. And that includes, again, corporates, SMEs, startups, financial institutions, advisors, as well as um, uh, NGOs. So that's on a pre-investment stage. Thereafter, we had to monitor their performance to ensure that they deliver what USAID wants. We want you to create jobs, mobilize the funding, and export. So we created this fishbone diagram. Uh, I've never used it before. I've been always thinking about finding a way to use it. Now I have. Uh, it's basically tracking all the key risks that we believe are relevant to this investment. And of course, there are other ways to do this through financial monitoring, et cetera, et cetera. But remember, we're not an investment fund. Our team is not comprised of Wall Street people. Very few of us are. So we had to basically tailor our skills, our capacity, and merge basically our thinking with the development world, with the finance people, to ensure that at least we're aligned in terms of how do we track the risk and performance. So we've taken all that internal versus external risks, turned it into some computational, thank you Excel, computational program that actually makes it very simple to say this is a risky company or it's becoming risky uh, transaction. Let's talk about how to help that SME. So as, as Jim noted, um, we had these pain points and financial or technical, even I would say there should be regulatory uh, pain points. So we did a bottom-up approach. When we were rolling this out in 2020, it made sense for us to go to the market and say, just you know, conduct a diagnostic, talk to the SME, talk to the investor, what's stopping you from investing in this particular sector, what are your growth uh, plans, and maybe we can do something. That tailoring, because this is relatively new, so they couldn't also figure it out how viable this partnership could be. And it took time, that's a lesson learned, it takes time to actually plan something, especially during COVID, because you had to go visit or conduct or talk a couple of times, everyone's doing Zoom, no one knew how to use Zoom, so that took time. And for us to go through different partners, you're talking about the fund investor with a larger picture trying to understand their losses with all the funds they invest, invested in. And so that's a different dialogue. And then you're talking to the fund manager who is saying this is a good opportunity for me to now come to West Africa because now I have a lot of opportunities to invest in. And then you have the SMEs saying we basically don't have access to capital. So again, all that was couched under the understanding of will this be a sustainable investment? Will, can we scale this and can we replicate it? For instance, through this partnership, we've actually launched the first impact fund in Cabo Verde. Now Cabo Verde is a very small uh, country, uh, a dot on the map. Uh, I hope no one's here from Cabo Verde. But basically it's the first Lucifone impact fund. So with that small fund that we're seeding, now there are dialogues about turning that 10 million fund into an 80 million fund involving key investors. In terms of replicability, we've launched, uh, the f our first financial institutions partners was with Cordaid and so, and DFC. We launched the West Africa uh, Bright Future Fund and in 2021, they started to engage with DFC about launching the East Africa version of that. So our products, again, depending on who the partner is, we've tailored the products to reflect 
their pain points. Now I'll give one example. Uh, Lofty Inc. Um, in Nigeria was ab able to use three products. They used their grant as cash collateral to go to the bank to get venture debt for their portfolio of ag techs. Then they used the investable first loss to basically attract US investors for their fund. And then they used some of the grants as well at, to prepare and uh, provide TA to these ag techs because they are very focused on seven Nigerian states and on five crops. So they, they needed a lot of uh, hand holding. The next few slides are just examples of how we manipulated, not manipulated, but how we basically used the partnerships. Here you can see the Ghana portfolio. The Ghana mission wanted a lot of missions, ranging from gender to the US nexus, US trade, to exports, food security, to technology, climate, etc. So we invested in 10 countries with a very broad geographic footprint, multiple kinds of crops. Amati, for instance, is the new crop, the fonia, the pearl millet, that we are launching as a new export crop to, uh, to apparel. DTRT is on its way to becoming a $100 million company in sales to startups like Frieslink, cold chain service to reduce food loss and waste. And this kind of multiple mission objectives is what we would like to replicate in other countries. Uh, so with larger economies like Egypt would have multiple missions. And I think what we can do is work with our partners to basically, hey, you know what we did in West Africa. We can replicate that here in Egypt with, you know, whether it's the Red Sea, technology, education, or ag. The second example is launching a specialty fund targeting women entrepreneurs in one of the riskiest uh, investment areas, the Sahel. So with She Equity, it's a, it's a VC firm. We provided two kinds of solutions for them. One is to provide assistance to women entrepreneurs under the She Equity Business Accelerator, Sheba, and provide the investable first loss for their first Seed, uh, seed fund in West Africa. And their goal is to basically raise $15 million to basically invest in many of these businesses that are typically ignored by the capital markets or just the financial markets in general. I'm going to note two companies here. Well, Farah, for instance, is a, um, it's a, it's a uh, fintech targeting informal markets in Nigeria mostly women. As you can imagine, a lot of women are selling uh, products on the street and they have no financial protections. They are funding that FinTech to actually provide loans to those informal companies as well as livelihood security for pensions, etc. The second one is Shuttlers. I think some of you might have heard one of the most famous Egyptian startups, Swivel, that went public uh, on NASDAQ. Well, Shuttlers is the West African version of Swivel. The third example is what we did for Cordaid in partnership with DFC. As you, know, as, you know, as you can see, they're investing in conflict countries. Uh, this is their impact first motto. And that's a lot of risk and they wanted to raise a lot of money. And so we partnered with DFC to provide two layer protection. We would be using our grant as a first loss and any losses above that, up, up to 14.75 million, DFC can cover with their partial loss guarantee partnership. The idea is to unlock uh, $29 million. If you add the three million, it would be 32 and a half. And to date, they have raised about 23 million. And the, ex the, the, the remaining six million will be raised in a few years. The last one is the, what Jim referred to as the cash value addition in West Africa for Red River Food. Again, the idea is to add value to the cashew industry in West Africa. It's, Cote d'Ivoire is one of the largest, if not the largest, producer of cashew nuts. All that's exported out of Ivory Coast to Vietnam and then shipped to California. So as you can imagine from a business perspective, that's a lot of time wasted on transit. But what if you just manufacture it in Ivory Coast and then cut the travel time to the East Coast where it's a big market uh, for, 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 for uh, processed cashews? 
So that's the key point in that partnership. With our $3 million, they would provide the $47 million, build a factory, process all the raw cashew nuts, and create jobs for the factory. We believe this sense of value addition, if we take a look at the Egyptian economy, when we looked at the OEC chart, there were comments about how apparel and some of the uh, processed foods can be actually be scaled and further value added. So that's one sector that we could target in Egypt. So what are the outcomes? Uh, for us, again, you know, challenging macro environment with the COVID-19, inflation, et cetera, working with eight missions, uh, wanting us to work on so many different sectors across different geographies, across different with different expectations. Uh, what we've done so far within these three years is that through our partnerships, we think we will be able to raise more than $500 million in capital. What you're seeing here, $300 million, excludes the impact of cash unlocked by the AGF partnership. So by adding that over, once that's validated, it would be over $500 million. And the SMEs at that point, uh, th three quarters of that, is basically triggered by that partnership with multiple banks across the region. With that, I want to say thank you very much. I actually, sorry, one more slide. Uh, lessons learned, and what are the next steps? So what we've learned is that it took time for some of the partners to really understand what we want because it's not something they're used to hearing from USAID. So when we began to talk to them about their own vision for expansion, for growth, or pain points, we're now able to say, well, well then we'll focus on that particular pain point, and can you deliver the rest? And that's where we then co-create with both USAID and both the partners to make sure that what they, what they agree on is doable. So for the next steps for us, we've actually identified partners from West Africa that are also in Egypt. This includes a supply chain fund uh, targeting organic um, exports. Their key market is in the US, but it's a, actually a Dutch company. We are looking at a VC firm uh, that's actually here, actively looking at new technologies that can be expanded and scaled across MENA. We are looking at um, PE firms as well that might be interested in expanding on in the largest market in, in MENA. So the next step is to align all these missions together and then begin to initiate the structuring in terms of uh, what sectors, which areas, which regions, or what themes you would like to, to, uh, to, to prioritize. So with that, thank you very much.